Today we're going to continue our journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. And I'm using the Gospel of Luke as the base for our understanding and going there to find the record. So if you want to have your Bible there, I'm going to read a little bit from Luke chapter 19. And then we're going to think about this moment when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Reading from verse 9, chapter 19, verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And we'll end there. But for what I want to do, first of all, is to take you back to an account that is to be found in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. And this is, a, this is a prophecy given by Daniel. Gabriel the angel tells him this, and the, the year is 538 BC. And it's a prophecy that pinpoints when the Messiah would arrive. And it begins with those words, know and understand this. And then he says, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with the streets and a trench and in times of trouble. After sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Now, you may have reflected on this at some point in your life, maybe you have not. And just bear with me and let it let it be and think about it. There'll be some who will agree and some who may disagree. But trying to understand what this word was given to Daniel, and it was about the coming of the anointed one, the coming of the anointed one. How do we understand the weeks, which is used in a number of translations? Uh, sometimes it's they talk about sevens rather than weeks, but weeks had a number of meanings. Usually the context determines that. And if we're to use a calculation, and the calculation would work out at 7 times 7 plus 62 times 7, which is really 49 plus 435, which is 483 years. So the prophecy further says that after the Messiah arrives, he will be put to death and will have nothing. The word after is important. After the Messiah arrives, he'll be put to death. And I think it's quite clear that Jesus' crucifixion fulfills that prophecy. Now, there is a quite precise calculation that is used to figure out the 438 years in the future. Well, when we talk about the decree going out to the restore the rebuilding of Jerusalem, it's, it's easy to figure that out because the exact date of that is March the 5th, 444 BC. And you read that in Nehemiah 2, verses 1 to 8. And then if you work out according to the various calendar, because there are two different calendars, the sort of lunar calendar, which is slightly different, and, and the solar year and the lunar year, which one was used. And it's the lunar year that was commonly used in ancient biblical times. And trust me, you can work this out. And if you want a bit of debate about it or to figure it out, the chronologists have estimated that the triumphal entry of Jesus, according to this, was March the 30th, AD 33. And when that's determined, it's understood to be the very day in which Jesus goes up 
out of the Mount of All, up the, the valley, into through Bethpage and Bethany, and into Jerusalem. And what we're really trying to do here is pinpoint the, the power of the scriptures to declare and to tell us about the events that are to happen in the future in regard to the prophet and Isaiah and, and Daniel leading on. We know there are other prophecies. Zechariah 9 9 clearly is the prophecy that speaks about Jesus' entry. See your king coming to you riding on a colt or the donkey, the foal of an ass. And, and these are in some ways to give you and I a sense of the accuracy and the confidence in the historicity and the words of Scripture regarding Jesus coming and who Jesus is. Jesus came into the city on two occasions. The first one is this great public declaration, and it's really Jesus declaring what he has for a long time kept quite quiet. Now he openly declares that he is the king. He uses the words when he's speaking about the colt and telling the people to give him the colt, the Lord has need of it. And that phrase, the Lord has need of it, the Lord. The Lord is the, is the Lord of heaven. Jesus is, is taking to himself this title. He is saying who he is. And then, secondly, notice the way that the people then regard this. They throw their garments over the colt. They spread them out on the ground. And in doing so, they are able to, um, as it were, affirm the things that are being said at this time. And that, that is a really a wonderful thing, isn't it? That they are also saying, what you see, we affirm. And then in the words, what words do they say? They shout out. They rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they have seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is a royal procession. That's what we're seeing going into Jerusalem. Jesus is the king. But he comes not as, you know, the king in his big white steed, dominant, powerful. He's coming, the king who is lowly. And always he is the lowly king who comes and he's coming to be crowned. Of course, his coronation will be very different. This first, this first coming, this triumphal entry is the first. There'll be a second one, which we'll look at in a day or two's time, but it's a private, secret one where he'll meet with his disciples in the upper room, and that's a very crucial moment. We'll think about that as well. But just thinking about what this means then, Jesus coming in, he is the king. He is the king who has come to be crowned. He's come to the city of Zion where the Lord has chosen to, to dwell. He's come for a very important reason. Everything is focused on the purpose of his coming. He'll spend a week and he will be uh, engaged in teaching. He will be tested in this week. And just like the lambs that are going up by their thousands into Jerusalem that will be slaughtered in a few days' time at the Passover, this Jesus, the Lamb of God, the King of Kings, is coming into Jerusalem. There was a four-day period where the lambs were kept, sort of making sure that they were without blemish, tested as it were. Jesus will be tested, the Lamb of God will be tested, and he will be to be found without sin. All these things combine together in such a mighty way, which can be so often missed if we don't take time to think about these. So this triumphal entry is our king who's coming. Jesus is the king. His kingdom has been established. The cross will be a crucial moment where he establishes it through the cross and the resurrection. But there's a future aspect to this kingdom. In a physical reality, it is yet to be seen. Christ's return will bring that about. Today, it's a spiritual kingdom. He is the king of my heart and your heart. He rules our hearts and our lives. He does rule the world, but he's not acknowledged as the one who rules yet. There's a day coming when he will return in glory and when every eye will see him. And what a day that will be. So this week, as we think about our king, let's think also about the king who's going to return. These are great truths. And if you're his child, you can really enter into the great joy of these truths. And I trust that just listening to some of this today gives you a new spirit of confidence 
and, and increase to your faith. And the Lord bless you as you continue to think about them.